experts in high-performance business, LMAC helps organizations compete by developing their strengths and competitive advantages. Well, rather than just showing you how to use performance improvement tools, their consultants have the necessary industry and leadership experience in coaching organizations of all sizes towards sustainable industry-leading results. Plenty there to talk about, and I'm delighted to say that joining me in the studio to talk about what they do is the LMAC founder, Nigel Reaney, a very good day to you, and senior partner, Barry Jeffrey, a very good day to you too. Now listen, you guys have been working in this territory for many, many years. How do you think the industry has changed during that time, particularly in this area of business operational performance? It's not a big mouthful, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so if we look at a 25-year period, um, I think it's true to say, particularly in manufacturing, um, a lot has changed in terms of low-hanging fruit being picked for productivity improvement. So around about 25 years ago is when I joined Toyota Motor Manufacturing. And we were just opened up to a different world. Um, and back then there was, you know, just really um, bad practices, particularly within manufacturing, really low levels of productivity. I think that's changed a lot. Um, but we tend to find it's changed more from a processing perspective. And I think that's where the focus has been in a lot of industries. And does that tally with your experience, Barry? I think it does. And I think the other thing I would say is that a lot of uh, organisations now, I would say in fairness, are much more uh, aware of clients' needs, much more aware of um, quality focus. Um, 25 years ago, I think it's fair to say, the customer would accept an awful lot of bad, bad stuff. I think we all understand that. And now it's much more demanding. So from a, a business improvement point of view, that's certainly something now that organisations look to focus upon. What are the main challenges that uh, businesses face when they decide to follow through a programme of business improvement? Because there are quite a few obstacles along the way. It's never straightforward, is it? That's correct. And it's, it's actually you, you're completely right saying it's never easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it and everybody would be successful. Um, I think it's fair to say the, the biggest challenge, I think, initially is the, actually the alignment of the organisation. What we see um, quite often is a lot of silo mentality. We see a lot of, to be honest, um, backfighting in boardrooms. And, and that uh, really doesn't send the right message out. So when we're trying to improve things, um, I think it's fair to say um, that is one of the biggest challenges we see, that simply the communication top to bottom of what, what the organisation is trying to do, that just has, hasn't happened at all. I'd like to pick up on that point about silo thinking and corporate backstabbing. I mean, look, I, I would imagine that out of the two, the silo thinking... Is the, is the easiest thing to deal with, but, but, but the corporate backstabbing, how do you navigate that and avoid getting sucked into a company's politics? Well, I think the first thing uh, that we start with is just why are we here? You know, so, and, and this really draws out um, a good starting point in any business transformation is having a very clear why. So what are we here to do? And if we come across things like, well, we need to improve and we need to change our business culture, that kind of thing. It's, it's quite weak. Um, if we find that we need to change to survive as a business, then we start with that um, rally cry, if you like. That. So it helps us bring the senior leadership team together and the board in terms of cutting through some of these politics. And in terms of the silo thinking, I think that's um, most organisations that we come across are guilty of that to a degree. Now, this really comes from a business level strategy down to an operational level strategy. Quite often we see um, a reasonably good business strategy but a very weak operational strategy. And really that's born of um, quite often you take the high level business objectives and then they're divided amongst the senior leadership team. Uh, so for example, a uh, HR executive might be given the task of saying, well, look, these are the business objectives. You develop a strategy now for people that aligns. And so the HR exec goes away and does that job. And if it's the manufacturing executive, that person will go and make a manufacturing strategy. So this is where the silo starts. And that's where we begin, if you like. So um, breaking down that silo strategy is the first step. Is silo thinking more of a problem in very big companies or does it run across the board? Size doesn't matter. 
I think it's fair to say um, in a larger organisation, yes, it's, uh, it, it is a bigger problem. And that can be if it's a, a multi-site or a multinational uh, organisation. Um, different cultures come into play uh, and the policies become a lot more complicated. But I think it's fair to say um, it does exist in all organisations. We have to say that. Mm. Yeah, to a lesser or greater degree. To a lesser or greater yeah. degree. OK, so silo thinking and office politics. What are the other common pitfalls that you guys experience when you're trying to get companies to actually go towards that business improvement, see the bigger picture? I think one of the challenges is to instill a degree of confidence that something great can be achieved because many organisations have been through many initiatives and, um, and they're all about improvement. So we can paint a picture of what's truly possible and it's quite ironic that getting that confidence at the senior leadership table is sometimes more difficult than at the grassroots level of a business. So that, that really is um, one of the first challenges that we face. It's a very challenging business landscape in which we operate, especially with the digital forces and the pressure on companies to embrace technology. But in your opinion, what are the other forces which make business transformation so crucial for companies? I think it's fair to say in the, in the current climate with Brexit and the living wage putting increasing pressures on organisations, um, the, the pressure to do it now is significantly more. And no longer can companies stand by the wayside and, and just accept things. As we said before, uh, customers are more demanding. So the squeeze on any organisation, whether it be uh, a manufacturing organisation, a service sector, public sector, private sector, those, those challenges exist. And I think it's fair to say um, one of the challenges we um, actually uh, see for, uh, from our perspective is helping companies organi uh, and organisations identify and, and see those problems. And that's something we certainly work on in the early stages with an organisation. Mm. Mm. And, and let's take a look at some of these organisations because how do you go about identifying what a company needs? Because something which works for company A might not necessarily work for company B, C, D or E. Absolutely. I mean, every business is unique and it takes um, a unique approach to help them get where they want to go to. So we always start by listening a lot and taking a good look, like I've said, from the operational strategy and downwards. And I think one of the things that we really need to look at is what is the current culture at the business? And I think that's something quite interesting for us going into so many different businesses. You can feel the culture from the minute that you walk in. And well, what do you mean feel the culture? Well, yeah, <laughs> you I mean, can feel hostility, but not a well, culture, surely. Well, sometimes it's hostile, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Quite often, I'll walk into a business and it feels a little bit sleepy. Sleepy? Yeah. <laughs> and people have turned up for work and they're doing the best. And it just doesn't feel very energetic. So I guess living in New Zealand now, I always think about the All Blacks. So they're a high-performance team. And I just can't imagine the All Blacks dressing room feeling sleepy. <laughs> There'll be some energy and some charge. So, and that's quite often how we leave a business, a lot more awake and energised. And I think this, you know, you're asking about the technology and uh, the pressure on businesses. Quite often, businesses are looking for the technological solution and they're overlooking the power and the performance capability of the people if they just truly woke the organisation up. And it's not anybody's fault. People aren't coming to work and just thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, cruise it today or something. The day. They're doing what they're asked for. And sometimes when you just ask for more in the right way, if it's an exciting way, then people, it's just amazing what people can do. Incentivisation. Well, I wouldn't say uh, incentivisation sounds a little bit related to money sometimes. Not necessarily. No, no. <laughs> um, but getting people involved in the journey. So if the leadership team can really communicate in an inspirational way, this is where we are, this is what we need to do, um, and get the people on board, it's an exciting thing. Right, and, and that leads quite nicely to my next point, because, okay, then, you've gone into a company... You've identified that it's a bit sleepy, lacking in energy, so it needs a bit of oomph. Mm. 
So how do you go about implementing that? You mean you talked about learning how to communicate people in a way that's exciting and interesting, but how do you do that if you're just used to saying to people, do X, Y, Z? I think it's, it's important to understand, um, certainly the way we work is to spend a significant amount of time working with the senior management team up front. And we're looking to find good communication routes to help with motivation, which is the thing that we really, really want to see. Um, we like to engage with the people, but we need to do it correctly. And we need to set the backdrops, and part of that strategy is the people strategy. And that is probably one of the most important things from our perspective. I think a lot of organisa organisations that have tried business improvement, business transformation, lean, lean sigma, all the names under the sun that we can have for these processes, um, they miss the people part of it. And what I would say is, um, from our perspective, that is somewhere we, we focus and we help the senior management team um, get the message right. If the message is right and the people understand why we're doing this, then they will support. If the message is wrong, um, it's very, very hard, very, very hard to get them to people to engage and make a high-performance workplace, which is what we're trying to do. Now, I'm glad you've mentioned that word lean, mm -hmm. because, well, there are one or two meanings. The, the common meaning we have in the English dictionary, as in leaning against a wall or something, mm. but in the er area that we're talking about, clearly, there's a bit more to it than that. I mean, what is lean, and how does it fit into the strategy of what you guys do? Well, lean was really born from the Toyota production system, which, in my view, it's an unfortunate term, lean. That was coined outside of the Toyota organisation. And I think sometimes it's had a negative connotation, as in lean being without fat, and people could fear losing their jobs and dance, restructuring, mm. all that kind of thing. But um, lean was the term that was adopted. Um, Lean really is the concept of identifying waste and eliminating it and adding value. So conceptually, that's great. In some cases outside of Toyota, something really important is being missed, which is the culture that exists within the business, the way we do business, the way we conduct ourselves. Um, some industries in certain parts of the world have taken lean on as a cost rip out exercise. Other companies have been hugely successful with it. So it really depends on the approach and the understanding of lean and what it's really all about from a people perspective. But it doesn't necessarily mean redundancy. When we're talking about cutting out waste, it could be that you've got 10 people who are doing 15 tasks and the surplus task could actually be concentrated or distributed perhaps in a better way rather than getting rid of people. Absolutely. Yeah, if it's all about getting rid of people, then it's probably doomed to fail um, in terms of a sustainability perspective. Because without the people behind it, it won't sustain. And that's where quite a significant number of companies have gone through a lean process. And been initially successful, but after a while they can't sustain it. And then you'll hear things like, well, we tried lean and it didn't work for us. So that's another challenge that um, high wage economy businesses have because if lean didn't work and if business improvement didn't work, then what are you going to do next? Mm, a big challenge. Mm. But it sounds like it's how you use this tool. It's, it's basically mm. a tool to show people or companies how they can maximise their resources, the resources being people to get the best out of them. Absolutely. And what we're asking people to do in an organisation at all levels is to identify that waste and come up with suggestions to improve. And we, we all know that the people that actually do the job are the ones mostly of the time with the solution. What we're trying to do is create that framework and that culture that actually gives them permission to come up with the ideas and actually help implement them. And I think that adds job satisfaction. And when we get that, we start to see the vibrancy, the motivational f issues that we're trying to fix go away. And less of the staff churn as well. Less of the staff churn. And that's something, uh, to be honest, there's a very key factor for us. So one of the things we do look at when we go into an organisation is that churn. That to us is a very good indicator of where the organisation sits in the preparation stages of whether it's going to be successful or not. And again, that goes back to strategy. So um, what do we do to, you know, to stabilise that? 
we all know again, we mentioned Brexit and there's fears about um, uh, shortages for staff and certain skills, we know that we have to invest in people. And in order to do that, the people need to be happy in the organisation and feel valued, feel wanted, and then the staff churn goes down. Uh, and that just builds that basis for business improvement. OK, so we've got the backdrop, very competitive, all sorts of forces happening, notably Brexit. So mm. what do you think businesses need to do to really set themselves apart so that other companies which are panicking, for example, mm. think, OK, you know, let's go to these guys because they know what they're doing. What do they have to do? I think from the top they really have to question what is truly possible from their organisation. Um, I think over the last decade or two decades um, companies have been on improvement initiatives and almost suffering initiative fatigue and it can turn into annual 2% improvements in safety and quality and cost and, and that kind of thing. But sometimes you just need to really challenge the boundaries and I think that's where we come in we can bring us a fresh set of eyes and we know what industry best looks like uh, and we can really challenge what's going on and say well you know if it needs to be a 20 percent improvement rather than five then it has to be 20 percent improvement otherwise the business won't survive and what's the point yeah it's and some in some cases it can just be uh, the difference between a quick death and a slow death so really establishing what does it actually need to be to survive and to compete and to thrive? Um, let's just put that down and say, well, if it's 20%, 30% improvement in certain types of areas, then that's what it needs to be. All we have to do then is figure out the strategy to achieve that. And this is where the people come into it again. And it's just amazing what can be achieved if you set that challenge. But the conversation starts at the top and then it distills its way down to the bottom. OK, let's, let's look ahead now to the future, OK? I want to know about the long-term plans you have for the business, but more importantly, 4.0. Hmm. Tell me about that and how it helps you push that relationship with your clients. Well, Industry 4.0 is an interesting thing. Um, it's really born out of Germany and um, German manufacturing are really looking at how the smaller second and third tier type operations can survive in a high wage economy um, against low wage economies. And typically those um, organizations have automated less than the large organizations. Um, the term lean, uh, sorry, the term industry 4.0 is different around the world as well because I think Another multiple interpretation. There are, yeah, <laughs> certain badges want to be put on this thing. But, um, sometimes it's referred to as Lean 2.0. Sometimes it's the Internet of Things and that kind of thing. So, you know, this is an area that we're involved in now and looking really at its merits because it's a combination of things such as automation and increasing automation. As the cost of automation reduces and the cost of humans increase, um, the trade-off curve is continually changing. Um, but it's also bringing in interesting things like not just robots, but cobots and um, artificial intelligence and augmented reality. Uh, and I think really this is, um, the 4.0 relates to the fourth industrial revolution. So people are beginning to talk about a revolution. And I think that's probably the day and age that we live in because we live now in a world of disruptors and Uber and all that kind of thing. So the question really for us is, is it really going to be a revolution or an acceleration of evolution? But the interesting thing, that where we're really interested is before we start jumping into extra automation and, um, you know, the augmented reality, are we really doing enough with the resources that we have currently? And that's the interesting question and that's where we help businesses. Okay, so uh, this is just, uh, just a, a basic aside, but Barry, I want to leave the closing word to you. Okay. I mean, you know, we were hearing there about the revolution, the fourth revolution. How many more revolutions do we have to go on this? <laughs> yeah, I think we need to be very, very careful and we're not just badging things for the sake of badging things. As Nigel says, I think we, we view this as a, an evolution of what we already have, taking new techniques and seeing how we can enhance what we do in terms of business improvement, not dramatically changing the way we do it. And I think that's the, that's the important message I think we need to, mm. to get over, is that we are interested in trying to move along, but we want to do it in the correct way, 
bringing the people with us. I think that's the most important thing from our point of view. Sounds like a good idea to me. Mm. Nigel and Barry, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you and good luck. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>